Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 43. I'm your host, Eric Moore, and today we're going to talk a little bit about public pensions. You hear in the news, hey, these pension funds are underfunded, the discount rate, what's the assumption on annual returns? And we're not going to solve the problem today uh, because there certainly are some problems with funding. But I just want to get you a little bit more aware when you hear terms like the contributions need to be upped or the returns are mismatched or they are underfunded or overfunded and what that means. And so generally when you think about a pension, it is a defined benefit plan. And a defined contribution plan is something like you work for a corporation and you enroll in the 401k and you're making contributions out of your paycheck. The company may match or they may not, or they may match up to a certain level. And whatever the returns are, along with the contributions, that winds up with a lump sum of money. And you can take that lump sum, roll it over to an IRA rollover once you leave the company. You can actually leave it in there, but you know you have more choices. And when you do that, then you can decide, hey, I want to take a certain amount of uh, drawdown or withdrawals from the account each month or each year to pay for expenses. The flip side of that is what's called a defined benefit plan. And a defined benefit plan generally is, let's just think about a state government or a city government who employs workers. They say, okay, uh, we, meaning the state government, we're going to fund this, and there's certain funding levels. Employees might also make contributions. But then instead of having that lump sum available, what they're essentially doing is they're saying, hey, when you retire, and, and there's all sorts of rules around it uh, about how much you get and when you can get it and all those types of things, but we're going to sort of guarantee um, a level of um, you know benefits. And that might be healthcare. It might be uh, sort of like a quasi-salary. And so what winds up happening is uh, people have a defined benefit plan they retire and they get payments, you know, maybe every month. And so it's almost like an annuity. So on one hand, it's sort of the the responsibility is flipped to the states or cities or the federal government. The federal government has as workers, of course. And then on the other one, it's sort of look, I mean, you put stuff away, the company or the municipality, there's some that have switched to defined contributions. They will actually go in and say, okay, what you put in and what you get, uh, you know, that's what it is. Um, but on the defined contribution, th- sort of the, the responsibility falls a little bit more to the individual. Um, some people would argue that, look, I'd rather just take control of my own 401k. I'd rather choose my investments. I can choose how much to fund. And I like the idea of getting a lump sum payout. And by the way, if... I've mismanagement, that's one one thing. If the government employs me and they mismanagement, mismanage it and then the benefits get cut or things like that, uh, I'd rather have control over that. So pensions have been in the news. They'll probably continue to be in the news. And the reason why they are is they talk about funding levels of pensions. And I looked and I'll put this in the in the show notes, of course. There was a tax foundation, I think Pew uh, did some research. I've seen a number of different uh, research papers on this. But they looked at, and this goes back to 2017, and they looked at the funding ratio of public pension plans. And they took a look at all the states, and they said, which ones are funded and at what percent? And some of the best, let's see, included South Dakota. They were 100% funded. Wisconsin apparently is 103% funded. Um, and then, you know, you go down, let's say Oklahoma, 78%. I won't go through each and every one of these, but the bottom three have certainly been in the news and that's Illinois, Kentucky, and New Jersey, respectively, Illinois is only 38% funded. And let's see, New Jersey, what were they? New Jersey is about 36% funded. Kentucky is 34% funded. And so one of the challenges right now is that when you have pensions, so pensions, when you think about these, it's a future liability, meaning the state government, they're going to have to pay out benefits 
they have all these different employees retiring at all different times. And then they have actuaries that say, hey, these people are going to live till this age. And you kind of take a look and estimate what the, the liabilities will be. And you're going to need cash to fund those liabilities. And if the, the funding doesn't match up with the expected liabilities, then you are underfunded. And so to put this another way, I took a look and said, okay, what if you had in 10 years, and we'll break this down into, you know, th- this is billions of dollars, maybe even trillions of dollars across all these, uh, these different states. But what if we said, hey, imagine you're a state government and you believe in 10 years, you're going to need a little bit o- over $2 million uh, to fund your liabilities that will be coming due that year. So what would you have to have now? Well, I know you're probably thinking, well, doesn't that depend on what you get as far as an investment return? So what these pensions do is they use what's called a discount rate. The median discount rate in 2017, according to this study, was about 7.12%. In other words, if you have, let's say, an amount of money and you assume that you're going to get an annualized compounded growth rate of 7.12%, you would take what you have now say, assume you're going to get that much, and then that's what you'll need right now to decide whether you're 100% funded. So in this example, let's say you need about $2 million for a future liability. So $2 million, and that's going to be in 10 years. Well, what that means is if you assume, let's use a 7.023% annualized return, something around there, right? Well, if we assume, let me just get you the right, yeah, one, uh, 7.2% return. What that means is if I have a million dollars today and I compound the money at 7.2% annually, in 10 years, I'll have over $2 million, a little bit over $2 million. And the way to think about this, if I know my liabilities are $2 million and I use a discount rate of 7.2% or an assumed rate of return, then to be fully funded today, I need to have a million dollars. So in that example, we would say we are fully funded because we have a million dollars today. Now, let's say that instead of getting, uh, let's see, let's say we don't get 7.2%, we get only 5% annualized compounded growth rate over 10 years. Well, then our million dollars will only be worth 1.62, call it 1.63 million. And when we look at that, what that tells us is that we would be short of our needed, you know, just over $2 million if we didn't achieve that discount rate. And this is kind of an important point because, you know, when you assume a discount rate, you assume a rate of return, uh, basically what you're saying is that you're assuming that you're going to make that every year. And if you don't, uh, if you don't, basically what happens is, then you can run into shortfalls. And so in that example there, we were only, uh, I think, roughly you know, 79% funded. So this brings up a question, too, with regards to discount rates and the assumed rate of return. And there's been a lot of consternation about this because interest rates are so low. You know, if you were running a, a pension in the 80s and you could, you could have bought a, a U.S. Treasury for, you know, a 10% annualized interest return, right? Because treasuries were yielding a lot more. In fact, if you would have done it in March of 2000, uh, not 2000, 1981, uh, you could have bought a 30-year bond for close to 16%. Uh, In fact, if you were running a pension, you probably wish you would have bought just a bunch of 30-year bonds and called it a day. So are are the discount rates or the assumed rates of return too high? And there have been some states that have actually dropped them. Uh, to give you a comparison, though, I just took a, I didn't do a comprehensive study, but I took a look at some of the annual reports of some corporations. And corporations, although pensions are less and less these days, uh, some corporations still pay out pensions. And I looked at the discount rates that corporations use, and they're more like 35 to 4%, meaning that's the assumed rate of return. And that's a big difference because let's say you move your uh, – your expected return from over 7% down to 4%, that means you would have to have a lot more money right now, right? 
So in our example there, just to kind of close the loop, you know, you have a million, you get 7.2% a year, you wind up at 2 million in 10 years. By the way, that's the rule of 72, right? The rule of 72 says you take 72 divided by our annualized return. And that's about how long it takes to double. In the case of only getting 5%, instead of winding up with 2 million in 10 years, you will get 1.6 million. So you're underfunded. And so if you were going to assume 5% annualized return, or if that's what you got, you wouldn't need a million dollars now. You would need $1.23 million getting annualized 5%, and then you would have a little bit over $2 million. So you can see that there's this thing where with interest rates so low, these pensions have to take on more risk, meaning they go into equities. And we know if you have a 2008 like event where there's significant drawdowns and you draw down the balance of your, your pensions, you become more underfunded, which can be a problem. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and I know some of you out there are wait, saying, wait a second, the assume rate of return is X because I say it is. I mean, they're, they're running some numbers on that, but I would say some of these plans have too high of a discount rate. Essentially, you know, when you're looking at anything over 7%, you're, you're assuming sort of, uh, uh, you know, geometric or uh, uh, compound annual growth rates equal to, to stocks more than, than bonds. Uh, certainly know that you couldn't buy 10-year treasuries and get 1.8, 1.9%. And expect to have a, a funding mechanism on your, um, you know, on your pension plan. So, there's a couple problems with, with pensions being underfunded. One of the main ones is that there is a risk that more and more money will have to be diverted to pension funding, and some of the other services that state or local governments provide might have to be cut. So, that's certainly an issue. And we think about this, and, and I, I should point this out as well. Part of this is the investment return. The other part of it is what type of contribution to, let's say, the pension balances are state or local governments making. So when you think about how do you get to, to 100% funded, well, it's a combination of getting some sort of an investment return. It's about the contributions uh, whether that be state and local government contributions, meaning they have to put money towards the plan, much like the same way you would say, hey, if I want to have a million dollars when I retire and I have this much now, if I assume this rate of return, I'm going to have to contribute on a regular ongoing basis. And if they don't contribute enough, well, then you could wind up with a pension funding shortfall. Uh, and then the other part of it is the benefits. And let's just call it the level of benefits. And so if you have benefits that are very, very expensive, um, that certainly can go into whether or not you'll actually be able to meet the future liabilities. And so one of the risks that a state or a local government that's underfunded on their pensions was well, a couple things. So how would you actually, if you want to uh, keep to the, uh, the promises or the obligations, so to speak, well, and you want to keep the benefits the same, what would you have to do? Well, you would have to increase contributions. You would have to hope that you would get outsized upside uh, investment returns and not have any drawdowns, not have any really bad periods. And by the way, the fact that pensions many years ago used to be much more in safer fixed income, and now they're in all sorts of things like hedge funds and equities and real estate. So there's more risk in there. Uh, but if you wanted to keep those same benefits, and you might actually have to have uh, current employees um, up there, you know, they may have to contribute as well on a, an increased basis. So the other thing that might come out of this too is there's a potential, and I don't, I don't pretend to be an expert on all these state laws and constitutions, and some states have laws about what you can do with level of benefits. But one of the risks to uh, retirees or people who will retire is that uh, a state would have to cut back on the benefits because they cannot fund them as they are now. In other words, if you said, hey, we're going to pay you 80% of your final year, year salary, and we're going to increase that uh, number every year based upon how inflation, like a cost of living adjustment, 
they might say, look, we have to cut that back because we're, we're so underfunded, we can't meet that obligation. And then the other thing is there have, you know, there's a quite a difference between some states, for example, I think I was reading uh, Wisconsin and, and Tennessee and South Dakota. I think those are the, some of the three best. Um, they, their state governments or their local governments, they kept up with the, what their actuaries or, or what the, you know, the people who look at this stuff say, Hey, you got to contribute this many dollars at this interval on these dates. And some States fell behind and didn't contribute enough. And as we know, what happens is it, it's almost, you know, now a state like New Jersey or Illinois or Kentucky, they would have to up their contributions much, much more. And I guess the best way you can put this is let's say that uh, you were, you started working at, you know, out of college at 21 and you're putting away your 10 or 15% of your paycheck, you're getting a match and you work for X number of years until 65. If you're consistent, you put, a, put away a lot of money. Um, the earlier that you put away money, the more time it gets to compound. Well, if you say, I got to have one or $2 million at retirement to live comfortably. If you've been contributing all along for many, many years, um, it was on average less amount per month or per year that you need to contribute. Well, if all of a sudden you have 10 or 15 years to retirement, you say, well, I need that one or $2 million. The contributions would have to be substantially higher than they would had you started all along. And that's one of the problems too, for these states that are really underfunded. It's that if they up contributions to try and let's call it a catch up contribution, um, it might have to be instead of you know seven or eight percent of a, a worker's annual salary, it might have to be like thirty percent of an annual worker's salary. And a lot of these states already are running tough uh, tough budgets and you know funding sources. Now, one of the other things that people talk about is the idea of some of these states that are underfunded needing to raise taxes. And so that's certainly, uh, if, if let's say a state wanted to raise taxes, of course, you know, people could move. And I think we've, we've seen some of that where very, very high tax states, um, if they were continue to raise taxes higher, you might see migration from those states to, to less, uh, tax, you know, less tax, uh, uh onerous states. Uh, but that's certainly one of the things too. So, to kind of tie the loop on this, you're hearing a lot of stuff about, and you hear about a social security too, but it's this idea of you've got these states, some states are funded up to a, you know, up to a hundred percent of what they should have now. We outlined that. We said, look, if you need, and there's the example, you know, and it's a very simple example. You need $2 million in 10 years. If you get 7.2% a year, you need a million now and you're hundred percent funded. If you only get 5%, well, then you're only about you know 79% funded now. So it starts to trail off. And it's a combination of the investment returns. It's a combination of the contributions. It's a combination of, uh, you know, obviously the level of drawdowns. And now that these plans are going into more equity type risk, they're taking more risk than they did when they could simply buy U.S. treasuries and get a very high rate of return or, or very safe, let's say, corporate bonds. And get a very high return. Interest rates are next to nothing. Uh, not to say, imagine pensions in Europe when they can, they're buying negative yielding bonds, but that's another podcast. In fact, we did one on them. Maybe I'll link to that. But the other danger, I think, with some of these pension plans in some of these states is that if they need to, so let's say they, you know, they want to keep the benefits where they are, maybe they cut benefits. But the other thing is, they may have to cut other services, raise taxes, or do any number of things. So maybe you don't get your garbage picked up once a week. You get it every other week. I'm just kind of saying that out loud. Uh, but when you hear pensions, the discount rate is the assumed rate of return. The higher it is, the less money that you have, have to have right now. The lower it is, you got to have more money to be considered funded. If you don't get that, obviously your funding gets thrown off. And then there's also this interesting disparity between what corporate, you know, public corporate companies have for their discount rates. As I said, I, I just did a quick sampling and it was more along 4%, not 7%, which is the median rate on uh, government pensions. And then, of course, you've got to take a look at what they're investing in. Uh, these days, they're investing in a lot of different things. So that's a little refresher uh, or well, let's say primer 
on to get you up to seed, speed when you're reading articles and hearing things in the news about this idea of pensions being underfunded, overfunded, or where they are. All right, folks, uh, once again, if you find this valuable, instead of spending the time and asking you to, to like it and rate it, um, you don't have to do that. Just share. Share this with somebody you think that might be interested in it, and uh, I'd appreciate it if you do that. We'll talk to you all real soon.